Hey, and a very warm welcome to the Into the Light Web podcast with me, your hostess, Joanna Hunter, metaphysical teacher, spiritual life and business coach, published author, and the high priestess of the Light Web, a spiritual technology that will change your life. This is the place to be to talk everything under the Light Web from consciousness, relationships, to money, to spiritual business, and everything in between. Hi, it's Joanna Hunter here from joannahunter.com and you are listening to the Into the Light Web podcast with me, Joanna. And I am joined today by one of my gorgeous clients, Sarah Marcock. Hello, Sarah. A warm welcome. Come and tell people what it is that you do in the world. Hi, Joanna. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, first and foremost. Um, So I'm Sarah Marcott and Right now, what I do in the world is I am a holistic and intuitive psychotherapist. I am a light bringer, coach, and energy healer. And I'm also an IET, which is Integrated Energy Therapy Master Instructor. So that's an energy healing similar to Reiki, but uses a violet angelic energy ray as the um, healing. healing Modal. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So we've been on a bit of a journey together because how many years ago did it did we start working together? Because you had when you first started this journey with me, you were doing something, you were still in the psychotherapy, but you were doing something a wee bit different. So let's talk about your kind of journey and your expansion. Yeah, well, expansion is definitely the word, Joanna. <laughs> um, since I've entered your world, that's what has happened for me. Um, primarily, you know, my consciousness, my mind has really expanded. I joined you in um, February of 2020 with LightWeb. And that was just perfect timing for many reasons for me. Um, You know, obviously, it was like just prior to the pandemics happening. Mm -hmm. Um, But that actually when the pandemic happened my business that's when it really pivoted because prior to it i had been working um full-time in my own private practice seeing primarily children and working really long hours um loving the work that i did you know i love children um but it was also just you know my self-care was not the greatest (laughs) at that time and so the pandemic for me um allowed me to work from home, which transitioned my business um, in a way that really allowed me to take care of myself better, you know, and I, it provided me with the contrast to see, you know, how what I was doing and like, oh my gosh, like what I need to be doing to really um, nurture my body, mind and soul. I love that. I think that was, I think for a lot of people, the pandemic was this like big pause button that got us to kind of like give us an opportunity to review things, look at things, see if we were really 100% happy there or not. Um, And it's lovely to have seen how your work has evolved. Did you find doing LightWeb helped you navigate the pandemic? Because obviously during the pandemic, there is a ton of fear that a lot of people experienced um and in light we give you the tools to kind of help navigate fear a lot more smoothly than normal is that something that you find really helpful doing that absolutely yes if that what that's part of why it was like divine timing that you know i was in that course at that time um and particularly too because the work that i was doing as a therapist was working primarily with people who were who experienced trauma. So now we're in the middle of this kind of global collective trauma on top of, you know, the existing traumas that they've had that honestly that we've all had in some way, um, myself included. And so LightWeb really um, allowed me to show up for myself in a deeper way, which of course translated into showing up and really holding that space for clients as well. Um, and I think one of the, one of the ways that I was just reminded of this, um, the other day, 
But one of the ways that I really um, appreciate LightWeb and what it's done for me is being able to see myself through soul eyes and have that soul mm. perspective. And what a gift that is because it brings so much um, laughter and humor into my life, which is, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm surrounding myself all the time with people who make me laugh, my animals that make me laugh. You know, I've got all these things to remind me, laugh, laugh. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so being able to tap into my soul self, um, when I'm in like, you know, some sort of like worked up state, like, oh my God, this isn't working. Oh, I'm so mm -hmm. frustrated, you know, and just like, oh, and then like pop out of myself for a second and be like, oh my God, you look like, you know, crazy right now. Like what is going on? <laughs> like, this isn't such a big deal. Like chill out. And and that what a gift that has been, you know, to be able yeah. to do that and to that. move between the two states of like being in that human that's yeah. freaking out, my hair is on fire, the sky is falling, and then to move into soul self effortlessly and yeah. have a good look at yourself and say, This is really the right course of action to be like freaking out right now because it's not such a big deal you know in the grand scheme of things it's beautiful it's done a lot for me as well being able to do that and you have kind of pivoted your brand a little bit to I'm safe to shine yes let's talk about that um obviously with your background as a psychotherapist and then we've got layers of these beautiful healing models like the light bringer healing models that come from our world and light web and all of that good stuff and then the IET and then you've got you know all these beautiful layers on top of the psychotherapy which is that really kind of more science-based and everything um Tell us what you feel is, let's talk a little bit about being safe to shine, because I think that's something that people really struggle with, of like allowing themselves and giving themselves the permission to actually shine, shine online or to shine in life in general. We're so conditioned to believe that standing out, shining and things like that is like, well, here in the UK, we have a lovely saying called tall poppy syndrome. And the, the tall poppies that get their heads lobbed off, it's not very safe, you know? So nobody wants to be the tall poppy, you know? Don't be a tall poppy, that's the conditioning. And I think that that's, yeah, that's people, isn't it? That's society sometimes. It's like, don't stand out, don't get too big for your boots, all of these things. And when building a business, you have to go against that societal advice in a way because you want your brand to stand out. You, you want people to notice you. You want people to notice your brand. Um, and then so suddenly you're going to have to fly in the face of like basically age old societal conditioning and advice. So what's your take on making that more safe for someone to really feel like shining? Well, I think I'm going to speak a little bit about my own process of it first, because I, that's how I tend to work with people also, um, is I go through something. I think that's similar to you. Like you kind of go through something and then you can share with mm -hmm. others. Absolutely. And, yeah. And so I just had a couple thoughts as you were talking about this and the shift, you know, in my business, um, I, I came up with the, the name I am safe to shine because I had that realization, like, you know, wow, I'm, I'm going from being a therapist that, you know, in that world, we don't, we don't put ourselves out there in terms of we don't share personal information ever with anyone. And, um, you know, we only share like our achievements and, um, and just the sort of surface level stuff, not like who we really are. So coming into this online world, um, and pivoting into into coaching and energy healing, you know, I what drew me to it is getting to use my whole self. And um, but it was very scary. And like, who am I to shine came up. And in and I realized that um, a lot of the work that I did, I was so good at seeing the light in other people and helping them shine and helping them see themselves the way that I saw them or see them. And so, you know, and just kind of reflecting back to them, like, 
this is your goodness. This is, you know, what you're good at. This is who you are. This is, you know, the love in your heart. And, um, and so I, I wanted that to be, you know, represented, I guess, in my new business as well. And, um, and so I came up with, I am safe to shine and I found you, Joanna, this is back when you had the pink hair and <laughs> I thought, okay, she is going to help me shine. She's got pink hair. Like, this is what I, I want to have pink hair and be myself and put myself out there just like her. So you really, um, inspired me to, to step out. Because I've actually got a funny story about my pink hair. Yeah. So let me share that with you. So I was so scared to get out there and shine. And I knew that I needed to create something that would make sure that it was like, I was going to have to, I was like, literally going to have to create my own gun to my head. Right. <laughs> and I thought, if I dye my hair bright pink, there is no backing down. Like, it doesn't matter where I go, people are going to notice. And that's why I went for the the loudest, brightest pink there was. It did tone down as the years went on and it went to like a baby pink. And then I went into the lilac phase and then I had lilac hair before I went back to my natural color. But um, when I was first, uh, you know, like when I first moved online, I, I knew that I wanted to like basically make that statement as safe for me to shine, right? And it's it's safe. And, and I also wanted to make sure that I created something that would mean that I could not shrink even when I wanted to. Like, you know, even that feeling was like, oh my God, like, who am I? And all of that, I was like, no, let's do the pink hair because then you are literally, you will have no option but to stand out. I love it. And, and, and that was it, you know, and it was the, the thing because I was so determined to change my life and I was so determined that I was going to do this. I wanted to make sure that I had something that basically meant that I couldn't back down. And so as an act of self-love, I colored my hair bright pink. I gave myself permission to stand out. I gave myself permission to literally figuratively stand out. Um, and that was the beginning of my journey was the really like a big beginning for me was like changing that hair color. And it was like, really, um, who could I be if I owned this pink haired woman? Who yeah. could I be if I owned her and, um, and allowed that version of me? Because the years prior to that had been the recovery of my multiple organ failure one of the things during illness and sickness that a lot of people don't talk about is how much that impacts your confidence. I'd gone from quite a confident person. There was a time about six months that I went through like um, agoraphobia, like I didn't want to leave my house. And I'd gone from like being super confident to like a person that didn't even want to leave her house. And I knew I would be like, I'd come quite far in my healing journey. And then it was like the stage where I'm like, okay, yep, are we doing this? I'm like, yep, we're doing this. And I was like, okay, well, let's create a situation where we can't back down. Yeah. <laughs> Unless there's a box of hair dye involved. <laughs> a beautiful act of self-love and I was like because I was so determined that I wanted this change and I wanted so much and I wanted it with my whole fiber of every fiber of my being and so I was willing to do something really crazy and it was you know it was something that made my inner child so happy like my inner child would have given like her her back teeth for <laughs> you know she would have given her right arm to have like pink hair when she was younger you know like she was like yay and so it was something that it was such a beautiful divine act of service for myself to give myself something that I it brought me so much joy like every time I looked in the mirror and I had that bright bright pink hair it just brought me so much joy and but it also was this total reminder you're not here to fit in you're not here to fit in. Yeah. It is okay for you to shine. It is okay for people to notice you. It is okay for you to stand out. You're not here to fit in. And, you know, and that was moving into that ownership of, because Skylar teaches, 
um, when you've been born to stand out, you were never meant to fit in. And I was one of these people that just never felt like I fitted in. Same. I, I, you know? I spent my life like trying to fit in. Like what would, you know, what would someone who fits in and is normal? Like, <laughs> yes, exactly. like that, exactly. Yeah, Joanna, I bought like books on like how, you know, to learn like what I should do in these kinds of situations and how, how to fit in better because I never felt like I fit in. And so um, I feel like the whole like beginning of my life was this journey of like trying to fit in, trying to fit in, trying to fit in. And then finally, um, you know, it hit me, you know, in 2020 there and it was like, no, like I was not born to fit in. I was born to stand out. Like I am going to, I'm done fighting. You know, that's, that was the whole thing. Um, I think that 2020 realized, helped me realize is that I really had been fighting myself like so me too. Much. That resonates I so much. And I mean, I think of anyone listening to this as like, oh my God, my whole life I've been trying to fit in. I've been trying to like be the good girl and fit in and, and not be too weird and, and all of these things, you know? And I think when Skylar had said to me, when you were born to stand out, you were never meant to fit in. There were so many realizations that happened in quick succession for me. The first being that I realized that I'd never owned that I'm different. You know, like I'd never owned it and just said, you know what, actually this is me. Weird ass. And I've I'm like got a crazy brain that never seems to stop. And I have the second consciousness in there too. And, you know, it's a whole thing. And I never stood up and like stood on my soapbox and said, I'm owning this, right? Like it's always been like, I'm so sorry, I'm weird. I'm so sorry, I'm this way. I'm so sorry, you know, like, right. because I didn't fit in, right? <laughs> and so like, oh, oops, oops, like, so sorry. You know, like this whole very English, so sorry, you know, like this. And it was, and I just was like, that was the realization, the first realization I had. The second realization that I had was that when you're not meant to fit in, you, you know, like when you're born to stand out, you were never meant to fit in. And the realization that I had been born to stand out, and that was huge. Um, and, and that asked the question, why? Why had I been born to stand out? And I, I knew it in my soul. I knew it in my heart immediately because I'm here to birth a new paradigm. I'm here to birth a new paradigm. I'm not, I'm not here for the status quo. That's not my purpose. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to birth a new paradigm. And I'm sure that when you started to work with LightWeb and things like that, and all of these thoughts started to come online for you, you started to realize, actually, I'm here for a brand new paradigm. I'm not here for literally same crap, different day. Yeah, exactly. And it feels so scary when you, you first have that realization. You know, it's all of the, you know, the who am I comes up, but, you know, also the what, what are people going to think of me? Like, mm. a big one for me, I think because of the therapist background is like, am I allowed to say that? Mm -hmm. because, am I allowed? To, like, you know, I actually I, remember some of our early coaching conversations where you would actually say those words, like, can I really say that? And I'm like, sure you can, you know, like, who's policing you here, you know, but yeah. We do such a good job of policing ourselves sometimes, right? Like, and we think, am I allowed to say that? Can I really have that opinion? Is that allowed? You know, and we we kind of, and and we got to ask the question. It's such a juicy question. Who's policing us? Right. Who's policing us? It's such a juicy question. Because we is. look at ourselves and we think, well, who, like, who's making you do that? Or who's... Per, like hold like who who are you holding back for and then right. when I start to realize that a lot of the time it was like the conditioning exactly you know that what yep. will they think well who are they exactly. do they matter you know and another beautiful teaching of Skylar is consider the source right and so this came through my channel and in, in one of my client sessions consider the source because I was working with a client she was freaking out about some stuff but the stuff that she was freaking out about was like this person that literally should have zero weight and zero opinion in her business because they'd never run a successful business in their life 
So not a great source to be given all that power to, to be given all that. And that's what came through the channel from Skylar, consider the source. And it's been such valuable information, you know, because when we start to examine they, we realize they're not even a great source of advice. Right. And you know who is, I discovered, is our inner child. Or oh, I love that. Our inner child. And lately, I don't hear people talk about this too often, but my inner teenager. Like, oh, yes, the inner teen. Yeah. Yeah. Like both. Like they really know what's going on. And they knew like who Sarah is, you know, all along. And so reconnecting, I think, you know, having a, a time to slow down a bit, um, and I'm still in the process of a slowdown. I'm my manifesting generator. I have lots of like interests ideas. And, <laughs> and ideas and yeah. And so it's like, I, I feel like the universe is constantly lately sending me signals of like lately being like a couple years. I don't have a great sense of time, <laughs> but <laughs> couple years of like, slow down, slow down. And the more that I slow down, the more that, you know, I can hear all those different parts of myself, you know, and the wisdom that they hold and like the truths that they have um, about myself or about life and just for me. I love that. Yeah. You touched on working with your inner teenager. And that's something that I love working with as well, because my inner teenager is a very sassy version of me. I find a lot of people's teenagers are, uh, but she's very blunt. She really does say it like it is, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I appreciate as well, actually, very much. But I think also as well, she has the maturity that my inner child doesn't have. So she's like a bridge between my adult self. Yeah. who might have bought herself a lot of different types of conditioning and when I connect with my inner teenager she doesn't she's like yeah I'm not buying that <laughs> she's like bullshit <laughs> yeah exactly she's like no um and it doesn't have the and but she doesn't have the the inner child has often, I feel like when I connect with my inner child, there's so much joy there, which is beautiful, but she doesn't have that as much. What she has more is much more like, she's more likely to call me on my bullshit, which I really appreciate. And, it, you know, and so working with your inner teenager, if somebody's listening to this and has never really heard about inner child work or inner teenage work or anything like that, what would be a good starting point, do you think, Sarah, for somebody to maybe like, you know, other than having a session with you, but like, what would you think would be a great starting point to just kind of make connection with these? Um, I think, you know, doing something that you loved to do as a child, like having something, you know, a reminder, sometimes like getting a reminder from people, you know, family members or pictures or something and that jog your memory of, oh yeah, like I really loved to do that. And then like making time and going out and doing that, I think, you know, and just re-experiencing that one that comes to mind for me and probably a lot of people too, um, is watching the clouds, you know, mm. like as adults, how often do we go outside and just like look up the sky and watch the clouds? Not as often as when we were kids and we, yes. would, you know, just lay back and find all the different shapes. And, you know, so I think like having the experiences, doing the things that you loved to do. Um, and then certainly journaling too is another great tool to have a conversation with your inner child. I love that. I'm a big fan of journaling. And it took me a long time to get into journaling. Um, I don't know if that was the same for you, but for me, it took me a long time because I had this weird concept that it was very self-indulgent. It was very like dear diary type thing. And I was like, what bullshit is this? You know, and um, and it felt very kind of like narcissistic and self-indulgent. And then when it actually finally clicked for me and I got it, I realized that for me, journaling was allowing myself to be witnessed, even if it was me that was the witness. Yeah, you know, and it was such a powerful power move then. And then I realized, yes, it's allowing myself to be witnessed in all of my glory. Um, and so my rule always was with people when they were like, when journaling, I always used to say journal the crazy out, like start and like, even if you're like legit, like if somebody read this, they would fear for you, like write like that 
to start yeah. with because what happens is if you get all that out of your mind and you get all that out of your head and um, eventually the crazy dissipates and more sane stuff starts to come out and then suddenly you look back at it and you're able to let go of some of those crazier thoughts that were would have been just left in your head had you not journaled them out and it's such a powerful tool I love the aspect of journaling and that's such a great tip for getting in touch with your inner child and I love doing something as well I love the tip that you gave of doing something that you used to love as children because there was a while there where I sort of stopped doing art and things like that as well and my healing journey so I I if you've listened to this podcast a lot, you'll know that I name my houses. But so when I was living in what was known as the Get Selfish House, which was my healing journey from multiple organ failure, in the Get Selfish House, I finally got a craft studio um, and like basically a space to have all my craft materials and everything like that. And actually during that time, I even taught uh, for the Highland Council, I even taught like craft workshops. But what was so lovely was art and crafts and things like that were things that I loved as a child. Like give me a glue stick and some paper and some pens. I would have been a very happy bunny. (laughs) So for me, it was, and I feel like there was so much healing and reconnecting to that part of me that just loved, adored making things, adored doing things as a child, you know, it was beautiful. Yeah, and not the purpose of producing, but yeah. for the joy of just being in it in the moment with it. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I went on a whole journey with it because as an adult, viewing that crafting through an adult lens was, I went through this whole journey of like monetizing it. And then it took some of the fun out of it, you know? Um, and I think towards the end of that journey, one of the things that I realized was that it was okay because as I like you, I'm a manifesting generator. If you follow human design, I'm a manifesting generator as well. So we tend to like be very good at monetizing everything. (laughs) We don't often have hobbies because we're like, we can, we can literally turn anything into a business um, as part of what we do. But I feel like giving myself permission to put the art into my hobby box was huge yeah was massive it was just such a beautiful gift that I gave myself of like this is allowed to be a hobby yes this is allowed to be just for fun and that really helped me to really reconnect with like my inner child and to reconnect to the lost little orphans of myself I suppose in a way the pieces that I had abandoned You know, I think a lot of people, a lot of us, and I think if we're going to step up and allow ourselves to shine, we have to kind of move into a self-acceptance of all of the pieces of us. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, um, actually, this is a a nice segue back into, I wanted to touch on something about journaling, Mm. but what I wanted to share about it, part of my resistance to it was always the fear of, um, of being seen actually. So you talked about, you know, it's a beautiful way to witness yourself, but the fear of what if somebody finds this, Yes. how absolutely, you know, insane or how dark my thoughts are, or, you know, all the scariest things that I think, and I'm pouring onto the page. I, I did journal as a kid. And it felt really scary. And um, unfortunately, I ended up like destroying all the journals that I had as a kid. I would love to have them now and read them, but they don't exist anymore because the fear took I, I The fear. Of, <clears throat> yeah. It's, and again, it comes back to that who's policing us, right? Like, yeah. is the fear policing us or is the, the you know, or is it, is it our, you know, is our thoughts? Because, one of the biggest eye openers through my light web journey is realizing that fear isn't even real. Like the danger can be real, like separating danger and fear from one another, you know, the danger can be very real, but the fear is not. That was like, for me, like that was, uh, you know, when Skylar taught me that it was like such um, a mind 
talk in a way just to call it like it was because it really blew my mind because the whole time I'd, I'd been so policed by my own fear yeah. You know, my fear had prevented me from doing things that I wanted to do or what would other people think and all of these things. And for many, many years, I'd allowed that to be the status quo of my life. And then to suddenly, you know, realize that, yeah, there could be, you know, like, let's use the, the old because our brain is so old, you know, that the heart, the software in the brain is so old, basically it's running on like, very very old software and the only way that we can upgrade that is through upgrading our consciousness um, and allowing rational thought to be the leader as opposed to instinctual thought being the leader but instinctual thought is looking out for that mountain lion and I realized I my brain was perceiving dangerous mountain lions everywhere and whereas a mountain lion is a dangerous creature and could potentially eat you the fear of the mountain lion eating you is not real because exactly. it's either happening or it's not happening there's no like middle ground right it's either happening either the mountain lion is actually eating you or it is not eating you if it is not eating you and you are in a state of totally frozen totally or in fight or flight then it's really at that point in time it's really just the fear creating all of that in your physical body and that was huge for me like realizing that oh actually maybe there's an option here that I could let go of that fear and I could live with less fear and that and, was massive yeah and the more adverse experiences that we have the more that reinforces that operating system of our brain you know and the more that it sets our perception to look for things to watch out for or be afraid of yeah yeah it, I mean it's like your your brain turns into a newscaster of what could happen right you're you're you know and this could happen and then you know if you put yourself out there and you go live on video then you might get hate mail you know and it starts giving you all these impending disasters right. that you know that are pure fear pure fiction Pure your brain made it up to try and keep you safe. Exactly. You know, I don't know, for some reason, this just popped into my head to share. So I'm going to share it and I don't really know where I'm going with it. But <laughs> <laughs> um, it's about fear and how I think one of the ways, because you're talking a lot about like the fear in the mind. And that's something that I think, you know, we all can relate to. And that's something very much for me. You know, I'm, I'm a person that's really in my mind a lot. And um, so being in my body and experiencing things through my body um, has been a really another helpful aspect of healing for me and healing fear. Mm. Just this weekend, um, my husband and I were, were restaining, we have a log home and we're restaining the house. And so he's like, he's a Capricorn. He's very grounded. He's a generator. He's like, you know, grounded down to earth. He's very in his body, you know, and we're such, he's such a good um, compliment to me in this way. And he, he's up on the roof. He climbed up the ladder and got on the roof. And then, you know, I was going to meet him up there and I'm like, okay, got to do it. And for me, I find that conquering that, you know, all the mind fears doing something physical to, to face the fear is like a real, um, a real tangible way for me to kind of face and overcome fear. And so it was a really like profound experience that I had this weekend. I, I climbed up the ladder onto the roof and I was like, Ooh, okay, I did it. Not so bad. I look up, there's, um, there's a turkey vulture, like, you know, flying overhead. I'm like, Oh my oh. God. A ladybug came and landed on me. I'm like, oh my gosh, hello again, you know. And then I look down. There's a feather on the roof, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, every I'm getting all these like signs, signs. spirit guides, and and I'm on. So I'm on the garage because that's where I had climbed up, and it's attached to the house. But you have to actually take a leap of faith. <laughs> For me, in my mind, it was like this is a leap of faith. It's not an actual leap, but 
you have to climb up over onto the roof of the house. And so it felt tremendously scary. And my whole body started to go, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. And that's actually when all the signs came, like, you got this, you can do this is, you know, what it felt like. And, and I had this out of body experience moment where I guess maybe it was soul self looking and going, look, what are you really afraid of here? Like, you know, you know, this is safe. You've, you know, you've seen Jason do it. There's, you're, you're not going to fall. Like my fear was, what if I fall? I'm not going to fall. Not even a little bit real. No, probably not even in the realm of possible. Like, unless you were being silly up on there, right? Like as long as you were being careful and cautious, like safe as houses even. (laughs) Yeah, it, it was safe. There was no real danger other than the fact, you know, yes, it's high up, but that, that was what was creating the fear. And so Jason, my husband, you know, offered me his hand, you know, I can help you over. And I was just like, I got to do this on my own. I was like, thank Mm -hmm. you. Um, but you know, let me just do this. And so I did it and I felt like so amazing, so proud of myself. And it was just a real moment of like, Cause I had been thinking like, you know, how am I going to put myself out there a little bit more in, you know, in the online world. And I thought if I can take this step, then I can do that. And so it was sort of like a little, I don't know, sometimes I make like little deals with myself. And I think as I started talking about this saying, sometimes doing something physical kind of gives me like a real yeah. tangible example. I think it's it's a bit like me dyeing my hair, you know, there was no going yeah. back. And once you got up on that roof and you got up to the first part yeah. in your mind, there was probably like, well, there's no going back now, like in for a penny, exactly. in for a pound, I might as well do the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. I love that. I love that. And yeah, and I think sometimes we need to kind of like create an action that matches our intention. Yes. Thank you for naming that, Joanna. Yeah. I think just creating this action that matches the intention and showing the universe, like, I am serious about this. I desire this. I want this. I'm willing to create an action to match it. Yes. I love that. I love that. Oh, my goodness. So tell us a little bit about it, because you did our Lightweb program, but then you went on and decided that you wanted to do our Lightbringer program as well. What was your big driver in deciding to do the Lightbringer program? I think, um, well, I mean, I knew. So I just knew that I wanted to do it. You know, it was it was a knowing and a calling um, that I wanted to do the program. If I go into like the thinking and how I you know, was thinking, I was thinking, you know, I'd love to have more of like an idea of what coaching looks like compared to therapy, Mm -hmm. because I I do want to be very clear in distinguishing that for Mm -hmm. what I serve. Um, But what the knowing and what really drew me to it is I adore light web and I adore like learning about all things energy and working with people in, um, in a holistic way in that mind, body, soul. And so Lightbringer is not just any coaching program. And that's what I particularly loved about it. It's energy healing and energy work. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's, that's what drew me. How did you get on with the healing models that we teach? Did you love them or what happened as you unfolded? I did. Yeah. It was a little bit scary in the beginning. Um, because, you know, you're really learning to listen to and trust your intuition. Um, but we practice that a lot and, you know, learn, learn how to, um, access that guidance and, and it really, it just became natural, you know, and it felt really, really good to be able to that. It feels really good to be able to help people, Joanna, on a different level than just in the mind. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, with psychotherapy, I had started doing some body practices by learning yoga. Um, You know, of course there's like breathing techniques and things like that, which are bringing the body in, but you're not really, you're taught, you're doing energy, I guess, healing without talking about energy. And so Mm. Lightbringer is really like naming the energy, talking about the energy and just 
having that awareness of, you know, how much is happening beyond what we're conditioned or used to seeing. Yeah, I think a lot of the, you know, with things like psychotherapy, it's a really amazing model, but quite often with that, we're limited to what our client comes to, like, this is what's on the surface, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, and exploring that energy at a deeper level it's kind of a little bit frowned on, you know, like, of course we want to kind of take them deep, but like, we can't be like, Hey, I think this might relate to your mother. Like we can't go like super deep there. And unless we're, we being given the invitation within the psychotherapy setting within the energy healing setting, like everything's on the table, <laughs> like everything's up for examination. <laughs> Right. And so it's really like, I feel like that's where my intuition that I had been using in therapy practice without like being able to tell people, oh no, I just know this because I know it. And, you know, I'm helping. Yeah. Them. I'd have to come up with like, well, you know, this is why we, you know, talk about this or know this. And it didn't feel totally like I could just be myself. Whereas in Lightbringer, it's like, you know, I bring like, well, this is what I'm seeing in your energy like this is what I'm feeling I shouldn't use the word seeing because it's actually a feeling for me mm -hmm. but this is what I'm feeling and picking up and sensing and knowing from sitting with you I love that yeah so it's, it's freeing it's freeing because you're not limited because it's like I think sometimes within I, I was getting an impression within your you you know when we were working together within your psychotherapy that there was sometimes that you were sitting there and you were like it's like, I know the answer, but I have to get that client to get to that place where they know the answer too. And it's not in case of just like, whereas what I love about Lightbringer is that we're just free to say, like, why don't we look at this area? Like, cause here's what's giving me like super vibes and let's look here. And, and then people, you know, and the most amazing thing with it is when we trust that intuition, our clients are like, they're mind blown. They're like, yeah. oh my god of, of course that's what it is of course that's what it is whereas in that kind of more psychotherapy setting we're having to wait and be patient and be like and then if, and like we can sometimes be like three or four sessions in and we're like there you are what I knew on session one <laughs> right and it's you're dealing with the like the defenses of like people get angry or like how could you think that or say that you know kind of thing if if we say like, well, I think it's actually kind of related to this, what's going on for you. It's yeah, there's just, I mean, but you're, we're talking about two different populations too. Absolutely. I think also as well, because I mean, with spiritual coaching, you also have to be open and available yes. to spiritual coaching. I yeah. think for me, that was a big realization as well of like setting that minimum standard in my own business that I only work with people who are spiritually open and that I only work with people who have at least a rudimentary understanding of the law of attraction. Because for me, having that minimum standard just allowed me to do my best work and allowed me the breathing room and the room to actually do my best work in, as opposed to trying to convince someone that the law of attraction is a thing or trying to convince them that spiritual stuff actually exists like that's not my job my job is to help somebody yeah. pinpoint the energy that's ailing them and help them to heal that um, and that's encumbered when you've got a client who's very resistant right so you've got you've got like two very different demographics there of so what that's what's that been like because that's a juicy question. What's that been like to pivot from this very left brain logical, yeah, give me the doctor solutions type thing, right? And then moving that into a new client that's like a lot more flexible, a lot more open, like willing to explore their spiritual side, willing to explore even past lives or like different types of energies. What's that been like? Freeing in one word, like freeing. <laughs> um, but to get more into it, you know, it's, um, I, I always felt sort of like an imposter as just, you know, in the therapy world, in the sense that I did use my intuition, and I relied on my empath abilities a lot, you know, and, 
And I felt like when I was discussing things with colleagues, I would have to kind of justify where I was coming from with things about, you know, what I saw as a treatment focus for this person, you know, and I always felt like I would be like getting in trouble or not doing it right because I was guided by my intuition more. And I knew that I was supposed to be much more of that um, logical brain thinking of, you know, have these reasons. Ticking your little boxes. Yeah. And so it's, so I guess for me, it's just been very freeing. And, and I will say, um, I've had a beautiful shift in the clients that I am working with now in my therapy practice. So open and available. I had one client say to me, like, wait a second, you know about crystals? I was like, yeah. She's like, why didn't you ever tell me about crystals? Like, why didn't you tell me that I should be using them and they could help me? And that was really eye opening for me because I thought, okay, maybe I can be myself a little bit more. So I think in some ways that's prolonged my transition process <laughs> um, because I, I feel I'm, I'm transitioning in a way into more, um, into new, new things, you know, my yeah. therapy this has been beautiful and um you know so healing for myself personally as well as of course fulfilling for all of the healing I've seen it do for all of the clients I've worked with but um it's you know getting to getting to be myself and be my best self as you were describing you know like that feels so good and I'm not a I I, I feel like it's still, there's still something in me that says you can't quite be 100% your best self as a therapist because it feels like there's still some boundaries, you know, that need to be held and they're, that are there for a purpose. But um, I want to bring, I want to bring all of me. Into all of it together. I love that. that. Yeah. I love that. It reminds me of a, a guy that uh, he's um, been one of my mentors, Dr. Brian Wise, and I I love his work so much, but he started off as a very clinical psychologist, very cut and dry clinical psychologist, didn't believe in any of that nonsense of past lives and anything like that. If you know who Dr. Brian Wise is, you will now know that he is the premier expert in the world for past lives. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it happened completely accidentally with a client that he she he changed her name for the sake of the book because she didn't want the fame that would be associated with it but her name was Catherine in the books and he writes about this in his books and it's just um you know and I think um his journey took many many years to unfold to get the confidence to even openly admit to his colleagues that this, he was going through this phenomenon of what was happening with his client, Catherine, and then began to happen with other clients. Um, as he began to explore past lives with them, which was accidental to begin with. And he actually, he was so distressed by it, he actually ended up having to apply Arkham's razor, which was like basically when all probable causes had been excluded you know, whatever is left on the table, how even improbable it must be the truth. And what was left on the table was this woman has lived multiple lives. And he was like, my brain is broke. <laughs> and it was an, inc it was an incredible journey. But one of the things that my spirit team Skylar has really highlighted to me is that you know, over the course of, and they actually highlighted this, that this was an aspect of, of being able to bring light web to a larger population. So they, they needed to raise the consciousness of the planet so that the planet kind of basically came up to meet light web because before light web was only open and available to people like monks and priests and nuns and people who were very, very high vibrationally naturally to be able to reach the level. So they began this process of really like on earth raising the consciousness, which is why we saw a rise in popularity of meditation and yoga. So those kind of started to facilitate this rise and rapid rise in consciousness across our planet and and as we began to rise in consciousness and you know I forget that because I you know I've always been spiritual 
So I've always been weird. And I forget that the consciousness around me has risen because I remember a time, you know, I used to say to people, I remember the time where I could clear a room by telling people I was a medium, like they would run for the door. They'd be like, oh my God, she talks to dead people. It was so scary, you know? And then now I can fill a room telling people I'm a medium. People are like, oh my God, do me, do me, read me, you know? And it's like so crazy to me. Um, And so my brain hasn't quite caught up there yet sometimes like uh, remembering that things like yoga and meditation are now quite accepted and quite mainstream and so we forget that people around us that we think are very close-minded might actually be a lot lot more open-minded than we think like your lady was like why didn't you tell me about crystals like I would have loved to have known Um, for me, one of my wake up calls came in my shops when I was sort of beginning my, I'd begin, began my spiritual events company. It was a pop-up company. And here in Scotland, we have a, this area in Scotland called the islands. So they're like little islands. Now the little islands, people from the islands, they are, tend to be quite different. Like they come from quite closed communities, they're very religious in the islands. Um, they have the most beautiful accent. It's like very sing-songy, like from the islands. And they have this beautiful accent that we all love. But, you know, it's a very close community. They very can be quite sometimes close-minded. And although I'm probably doing a lot of people from the islands a big dis- uh, disfavor by saying that because it's not always. But they are very run by religion a lot in these islands. They have the the We Free Church. It's very dominant um, in in the culture in those islands. And so when I started doing my spiritual events company, I had these customers. It was um, a mother and a daughter, and they were from the islands. And I had this poster up in my shop. And I was kind of praying that they wouldn't notice the poster saying mediumship evening. And so the mother says to me, Oh, Joanna, what is this? This mediumship evening, she says. And I think, oh, my Lord. I'm starting to sweat a little bit because I'm thinking she's probably going to be like, I'm going straight to hell, you know, for because that was my fear. That was my perception of like, oh, my God, she is going to freak. So I tell her what it is. Oh, she says. She turns around to her daughter and she says to her, she says her daughter's name and she says, did you hear that? And her daughter says, yes. Oh, and then you said, we love a mediumship evening. Well, you could pick my jaw up off the floor. Wow. These two women ended up coming to nearly everything that I did. They came to my workshops. They came to all of the things. And nobody was more shocked than me because I had had this preconceived idea, this preconceived perception that they came from the islands. They were probably super religious and that they were probably going to be very close to the idea of mediumship. It turns out that they were absolutely raving fans of mediumship. They loved it. They loved the comfort it brought. They had a, the mother had unfortunately lost her son. It had brought them so much comfort um, as a sister and a mother that has lost, you know, a brother and a son. It had brought them so, so much comfort to know that that son was still alive in the spirit world, still watching in on them, still looking in on them, still part of their family. And it was such a huge thing. And I think that was when I really learned my lesson that, well, don't judge a book by a cover. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the old classic don't judge a book by cover but I yep. think also as well like just the fact that the consciousness of this planet has risen so much we can't just naturally assume that people might be close to the idea of spiritual stuff yep I agree because more often than not I think they're open they're just too, they're just like us living in fear that somebody might think they're weird <laughs> exactly exactly uh, the way I see things now is that there's more weird people than not weird people on this planet, I think. <laughs> yes. What a thing to celebrate and feel good about. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. I have loved this conversation. I feel like we have visited so many beautiful houses like fear and inner child and sh- safe to shine and all of this good stuff. 
tell people, Sarah, where they can find you on the internet. If they're listening to this interview, they're inspired, they want to get in touch with you um, and work on their own healing journey. How can they do that? Uh, so I have a website, um, IamSafeToShine.com. I'm also on Instagram at I am safe to shine. And then I'm on Facebook uh, at my pages, I am safe to shine. <laughs> and also I have a free Facebook group called Heart Harmonizers. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah. And and one final thought here on the name, I am safe to shine, because you notice I just laughed as I kept repeating, I am safe to shine. I, I intentionally I originally called the business safe to shine. And I was like, mm, something's not quite right. And then I added, I am. And that just makes all the difference because they feel like every time somebody says my business's name, they're stating a declaration to the universe that they are safe to shine. And every time I say it, I'm affirming for myself, oh yeah, girlfriend, like I'm safe to shine. So I just, you know. I love that. Yeah. Just wanted to add that in there. I love, 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 love that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. I really appreciate this and I, I just love this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna.